Hello Science family. Today we're going to be looking through Periodic Trends Worksheet 2 and trying to make sense of how the location on the periodic table can give us a better estimate of comparing two different elements. So the first thing we are going to start with is question number one and it says which of the following in each pair has the smallest radius? Now if you recall getting the smaller radius the atomic radius gets smaller when you go left to right on the periodic table. And that's because as you go across, you add more protons, but it's the same amount of energy level. So you just pull those electrons in a little bit closer. So atomic size gets smaller and smaller as you go from left to right. Also, it's going to get smaller as you go up the periodic table. The reason is you're losing energy levels as you go up so it gets smaller and smaller. So based off its location, we should be able to tell what element is smaller than the other. So let's take a look. We've got first phosphorus and oxygen. Now, as you go up and over on the periodic table, they get smaller. So oxygen is not only above phosphorus, but over to the right. So oxygen is definitely going to be your smallest. If we look at Te and I, tellurium and iodine, as we go to the left, we get smaller. So that means that iodine is going to be smaller. If we look at neon and krypton, remember as you go up the periodic table, you get smaller and smaller. So therefore neon is up higher than krypton, so it'll be smaller. Last for number one is sodium versus sulfur. Notice that sulfur is way to the right of sodium. So that means as we go from left to right, the atomic radius gets smaller. So sulfur is going to be much smaller. So we completed number one. Let's go to question number two. Which of the following in each group has the largest ionization energy? Remember, ionization energy is how much energy it takes to pull an electron off of that atom. Remember, the smaller the atom, the greater energy it takes to pull it off. So out of all of these, these sets of three, you wanna find the smallest one, and that will tell you which one has the greatest amount of ionization energy. So let's compare sulfur, chlorine, and argon. Since argon is furthest to the right, Argon is going to have the smallest atomic radius, which means that it's going to have the largest ionization energy. It's going to take, be the hardest to pull off. All right, how about the next one? Potassium, calcium, and rubidium. Now remember, to get the highest ionization energy, that means which one is it the hardest to pull an electron from? The hardest one to pull it from is the smallest. So as I go up, and over, I get smaller in size. So that means calcium is my smallest element, so therefore it has the highest ionization energy. Looking at argon, xenon, and krypton, right, as we go up the periodic table, the atom size gets smaller. Therefore, the smaller it is, the harder it is to pull off, requiring more energy. So argon ends up being having the highest ionization energy. And last but not least, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. As you go to the right, atomic radius decreases in size. So therefore, oxygen would be the smallest, meaning it's the hardest to pull an electron off of, so it would have the highest ionization energy. The next question focuses on who has the highest electronegativity in the group. Remember, as you go up the periodic table and over all the way to fluorine, that increases in electronegativity. In fact, fluorine is the most electronegative element. Remember with electronegativity, we ignore the noble gases. They don't have any because they're happy and stable with their eight valence electrons already. So let's take a look at some of them. Boron, carbon, and nitrogen. Since nitrogen is furthest to the right, it is going to have the most electronegativity. Also remember, the smaller the atom, the more the atom wants to hold on to its electrons. So that's why electronegativity increases as the size of an atom decreases. Let's look at boron, aluminum, and germanium. 
taking a look at all three of those, as we go up and to the right, electronegativity increases. Now you may be confused and think, well, germanium's further to the right, so does that make it more electronegative? But remember, germanium has two full energy levels over boron. So boron, really, with two less energy levels, is those electrons are gonna be much closer to the nucleus, and therefore the nucleus is gonna hold on to those electrons and the electrons from outside objects are going to be pulled because they get closer to the element. So boron is definitely gonna be the one that's more electronegative. For letter C, it's gonna be germanium, oxygen, and phosphorus. This one's nice and straightforward because we know electronegativity increases as you go up and to the right. Oxygen is going to be the one, why? Again, oxygen's the smallest element and therefore outside electrons are going to be pulled more by smaller atoms because they can get closer to the nucleus. And last but not least, selenium, sulfur, and chlorine. Since chlorine is the furthest up and to the right, chlorine is going to be the one with the most electronegativity. It also has the smallest atomic radius, and that's because it is furthest up and to the right. Remember, the smaller the atom, the more it can pull on outside electrons. As far as number four is concerned, the three metal families, you already know these already and can write them yourself, but that would be the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, and of course the transition metals. When it comes to two non-metal family names, we know group 17 and 18, the halogens and the noble gases. When it comes to number six, what are valence electrons? Right? Those are the outermost electrons in an element, right? The outermost electrons. Remember, we care about the outermost electrons because those are the ones that are involved with the outside world and bonding. So valence electrons basically give the atom its chemical properties. Why is the periodic table helpful for scientists to use? I think the main point that we've been focusing on here is that it's full of trends right? Like knowing atomic radius, electronegativity, ionization energy, where the metals and non-metals are, valence electrons, uh, charge, like group one is always plus one charge, group 13 is always three plus charge. So I think the trends really allow us to get a grasp on comparing different elements, which is really helpful. It's beneficial. For the group questions eight and nine, they're focused on valence electrons and also the charge. So let's go through the trend really quick. Valence electrons go in order of one, two. Remember, we skip the transition metals and then go three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now related to that is going to be the charge. Remember, elements either wanna get eight valence electrons or they wanna get rid of that outer shell so that they can unlock and open up the shell beneath it to be full. So for the first three valence electrons, one, two, and three, they're going to lose their electrons and get a positive charge. So it goes plus one, plus two, plus three. Four is in the middle as negative or positive four, but a lot of times those guys in the four column are more with covalent bonds, so they don't really do the charges as often. All right, and then five, you need three more electrons to get eight, so it gets a negative three charge. Six valence electrons, you need two more to get eight. Seven valence electrons, you need one more to get eight. And then of course, group 18 has a full eight valence electrons, so it doesn't get a charge, it's zero. But now that we know those trends, we can fill these guys in really straightforward. How many valence electrons does beryllium have? Well, it's in group two, so it has two valence electrons. Phosphorus is in group 15, so it has five valence electrons. Neon is in group 18, so it has eight valence electrons. Aluminum is in group 13, so it has three valence electrons. Now, if we look at those guys from up above in eight, and they made ions, so they got a charge, we know the beryllium would form a plus one charge. Phosphorus, having five valence electrons, would form a negative three charge overall. Neon, being in group 18, a noble gas, forms no charge, it's happy. And aluminum being in group 13 would form a plus three charge. So again, knowing those trends make it very easy and straightforward for us to be able 
to predict, you know, what the charges are, how many valence electrons it has. And looking at the next question, why is the periodic table called the periodic table? Remember, periodic is a word for like a pattern or a trend. So we know the periodic table is full of patterns or trends. Otherwise, it'd just be a list of elements in alphabetical order. But we put them in order by different trends and patterns. For our next question, determine what charge each atom would form as a cation or anion. Again, we're going to do our trend like we did earlier up above, plus one, plus two, plus three, right? Skip or plus or minus four for that charge. Then we're gonna do minus three, minus two, minus one, and zero. So if we look at calcium, calcium's in group two. Group two always forms a plus two charge. Chlorine is the next one. Chlorine's in group 17. 17 group, since they have seven valence electrons, only need one more electron to get eight. So that means they form a negative one charge. Oxygen in group 16 has six valence electrons. So it only needs two more electrons to get a two minus charge. And lithium is in group one. So it only needs a plus one. Sorry, I did plus two and then one plus. You could do either way for this class, but technically you're supposed to put the number then the charge. But knowing that allows us to, uh, using that trend, we can figure out what the cation or anion is. By the way, positive charges are cations, negative charges are anions. That's a good quick little review. All right, now comparing here, the, who has the lower ionization energy? For lower ionization energy, we're really looking for which element is larger. Because remember, the larger the atom, the easier it is to pull an electron off of it, which means it's less energy. So less energy is lower ionization energy. Okay, so calcium versus potassium. Remember, as I go up the periodic table and over, my elements get smaller. So if I look at potassium and calcium, right, it looks like calcium's going to be smaller, potassium is going to be larger because it's closer to the left, and the larger element has a lower ionization energy. So for me, that means that I am going to go with potassium for my answer. Cool. How about silicon versus nitrogen? Silicon's here, nitrogen's here. As we go up and over, it gets smaller, so that means silicon must be my larger element and my larger atomic size means the lower ionization energy, which is good. Next up is going to be aluminum and phosphorus. So aluminum versus phosphorus. Phosphorus is further to the right, making it smaller. So aluminum is larger. If aluminum is larger, it's easier to pull off an electron, which means a lower ionization energy. And last but not least, Looks like we're comparing cesium to rubidium. Cesium and rubidium. We know as we go down the periodic table, it gets larger in size. So cesium is larger in size, meaning it takes less energy to pull that electron away from it. And that completes our periodic trends worksheet too. Hopefully this gave you the support you needed, but that you're also seeing the different trends and how often they relate to the atomic radius and the atomic size. Great job, science fam. Keep up the good work and best of luck.